Welcome back, Tension. What a week it has been for Real Madrid champions. And now they're in the final of the Champions League. Sapiwa, in minute 85, did you believe in the comeback? Nope, not at all. And I think I even said this to you going into the game. I thought this was going to end in a 1 1 or a 2 2. I would have signed off for that result happily going into the game. Yeah, and, and it feels like in that game, it was like Carla Chelsea wanted to slow down the pace of Manchester City and the game plan was working. But then when Mars scored, you got the feeling that City were more likely to make it two or three than Madrid were more likely to score in the sense that Jack Grealish had those two chances, which he should have put away. I had blind faith that Madrid were going to come. But watching that back, I was like, how deluded was I? Yeah, when the Marius goal went in, I, I was for sure just like, okay, the game's done. Let's pack it up. We did our best because honestly, going into the season, like most, no one would have predicted for us to even reach the semifinals. So I think if we had even been knocked out at Chelsea, that would have been acceptable, I guess. But given the context of what then happened, uh, like, I don't know, this team, they're just, they're just so resilient. Like, I, I have no words. <laughs> to explain what keeps happening but for some reason when we go a goal down two goals down the team sort of just switches on and wakes up yeah and it's like almost a save when Rodrigo scored and at the burn about they're like plus six minutes the fans could feel it the players could feel it like everyone could feel that if Madrid get one more chance it's going to be a goal and yeah the, atmosphere, the body language that's... especially from Edison was telling like, the, the, yeah. as soon as the first goal went in, you could tell Ederson was just like, oh, no. <laughs> like, it, normally other players would be like, you know, trying to G up their team and be like, okay, we conceded one, let's go, let's get back into it. But Ederson was just a ghost after that first goal went in. Yeah, and the Champions League, it's all about moments, right? And with Real Madrid, that's why they're so good in this competition. They're a team better than any other team in the world that picked the right moments. You saw that against PSG. We saw it against Chelsea, although in the Stanford Bridge, they were the best team for most of the game. But in that game at the Bernabeu, they were outplayed by Chelsea. But in those moments that mattered, they picked it up. And that was what won them this game because it's true, like in football, the team with more possession tends to win, but it's decided in a matter of a few minutes and, and five minutes decided this game. Yeah, and especially in tournament football, it's all about moments because in a league season, you have to be consistent and dominant throughout. That's why I think uh, like heavy possession-based styles and dominant styles tend to favor league seasons. Whereas in cup competitions, like you were saying, it's all about those moments. Like you can be the worst team for like three, three out of the four halves. But as long as you take your chances and basically when it matters, then you can go through in cup football. That's true. And Rodrigo, what a week this is. He's never going to forget this week for the rest of his life, is he? Nah, never. <laughs> we yeah. used to nickname him Mr. Champions League just as a joke because he, he scores more Champions League goals than league goals, but now it's becoming so true. I think he's actually got the best goals per minute ratio, if I'm not mistaken, in terms yeah. of UCL performances. And I believe he's Madrid's second top scorer in the UCL, which is madness. And what a time he scores the winning goal, the goal that pretty much wraps up the league. He scores those two goals against City, scores against Chelsea. And a lot of Real Madrid fans coming into this season, they would have said maybe he should be sold when Mbappe comes. But with those performances, with those key goals, he's proven that even when Mbappe comes, he still has futures. Yeah, and that's something that I think is very key because a lot of fans we're ready to bin a lot of these squad players. But like I'm always saying, you need a full squad because seasons are a marathon. So even if someone is not necessarily your starter week in, week out, you need talented players like Rodrigo always in and around the squad. And I think for him as well, he's not too demanding of like a starting position. So he's not as like um, put into pressure the way Vinicius is. He's more of just, he's in the squad. If he plays, he plays. If he doesn't, he doesn't. But He's ultimately just basically 
an impact sub. And I think even when Bappe comes through, I would still like to see uh, occasional games where we have Vinicius on the left or Vigo on the right. Yeah, I think that would work perfectly. But we're going to talk about it from a Man City perspective, Oscar. Did Pep Guardiola <laughs> make his substitutions too early? No. Honestly, I don't think Pep made any mistake. You can call bringing on Fernandinho a bad decision, but he got everything he wanted to do right. It's just that the players let him down in this case. Yeah. You know what? I'll, I'll slightly disagree with that. And the reason is, mm-hmm. if you're going to extra time, I feel you need at least one dangerous player out there. And what he did is he took out Kevin De Bruyne. Mm-hmm. Fine. But then he took off Mahrez, he took Gabriel Jesus, which effectively limited the outlets for City if they were going to keep yeah, the Sure. And that's why I feel maybe they sort of lost the tie because if it went to extra time, which it did, Madrid had the momentum because the other players were more, like, were more likely to score. Yeah. But even still, like City had Grealish, Foden, and Sterling came in extra time, so there was still enough quality here to at least threaten Real Madrid, but they were unable to threaten them after Real Madrid scored. Like we've said, once Real Madrid scored the first goal, everyone knew what was going to happen. They defended solidly after that. They, they could even take off Benzema, you know, because they knew they could hold out once they got ahead. Yeah, even Lord Vallejo had a great game. Didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> Lord Vallejo. Coldest man yeah, on the pitch, yeah. Yeah, we might make it fun of him, but he's he's been superb in the last couple of games. Yeah, he's yeah. had three three solid games. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he was. Yeah, besides the penalty today, which we'll come back to later, I thought he was okay today, honestly. Yeah. And from a Man City perspective, what were those mistakes that they made that allowed Romero to get back into it? The mistake Man City made on is not finishing them off in the first time. Yeah. That's the big. That's the biggest mistake you can make against Real Madrid. Because if there is hope, they will take it. That's just the. That's just the issue. Nobody knows how they do it, but we know <laughs> that somehow they are going to do it. They, they defy science, honestly. Yeah, they, they do. But the thing is, you can see this coming. Like if you watch Real Madrid or you watch any other year football, you know. Late goals are always a theme. Mm-hmm. And Real Madrid, they're the team that have picked up the most points from the last 10 minutes. They picked up 17 points from the last 10 minutes. Mm-hmm. And so, and I know this is junk time, so if you take out the last 10 minutes, maybe they'll still be fighting to the get moments and they want to wrap it up. Yeah. And that's, that's why you just have to kill them. You just have to save them when you're on top. Exactly. Because the Champions League is the Tournament of moments and Real Madrid's best moments, they happen to come in the 90th and 91st minutes and they took them. <laughs> That's just how it is. Yeah. I, I was I was chatting with a few Real Madrid guys during the game and one of one of my Real Madrid friends was just like telling like, oh, my heart's pounding, they're making my blood <laughs> pressure rise. And I was like, dude, you're going to remember the scene for the rest of your life. And I think most of you still go. <laughs> yeah. But... Moving on from the, the derby today, it mm-hmm. felt almost like a preseason game. They said it's out. It, Roman Madrid played a B team. There was, there was no urgency, it felt, in the first. It was, it was very rare. Yeah, it felt, it felt like Real Madrid were just packing it in. They were just like, hey, we're here for vibes. And then Atleti... Atleti took the game very seriously, obviously. They were really intent on getting as many goals as possible, but their finishing was just not on hand today. And as well as Atleti played in the first half, when they started to drop back in the second half, they just started thinking, would history repeat itself again? Because Atleti have been in this situation with Real Madrid many times before. Yeah. And, you know, somehow Real Madrid would stop them from winning the last minute. But today, Atleti, you know, kept them out and they've gotten an important win. Yeah, I was kind of surprised to see his tactics in the second half because you play the first half, you're dominating, you're on the front foot. I guess the rival plays as well in the second half, but 
when you're defending so deep against a team that's essentially a second string team, it doesn't fill you confidence. And I was sort of like curious what would have happened if Benzema had come on, maybe Roman Gudu got to make the rising goal, because they did have a few really good chances and all black had to be on his game to, yeah. to give them the win. Yeah, but it's not really surprising that Simeone, Simeone's Atletico play well for the first half and then kind of take it easy as the game goes on. It's pretty much how he approaches these games. And to be fair to them, while they were sitting back, they did have many chances to kill the game off. Korea and, sorry, I said Korea, Carrasco and Griezmann could have had a hat trick between themselves. Uh, if you want to bring it back on, for this discussion about the Paseo, the guard of honor. It was a huge deal whether Atletico should have given it or not. You're a Real Madrid fan. Do you care whether Atletico did? Uh, honestly, at the end of the day, I don't really care whether like anyone upholds the tradition or not. But what I do get angry at is I don't know why um, they view it as such a disrespect. And I think we were even speaking about that on Twitter, where I guess in this generation, it's looked as more like, oh, it's an embarrassment kind of thing, rather than the initial idea that it was, or if it's just more like a sportsmanship, you know, congratulate the victors. And then next season, you hope to be the ones being given the guard of honor. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with that. And it's, I feel the 2008 guard of honor changed the dynamic of honors because Legitimately, it was used as a way to mock Barcelona for years. And when it happened in 2018, when first Barcelona did not give it in 2017 after the club broke up, then Real Madrid were like, okay, so we do it. we're not going to do it. Then I feel it sort of tainted that tradition in Spain. Yeah, agreed. And like, I, I still just, just be sportsmanship, be, be adults, basically, yeah. <laughs> give the guard of honor and move on. Like, it's not, yeah. it's not going to hurt anyone. Yeah. Yeah. Just give the guard of honor and beat them. <laughs> That's the best way. Exactly. So moving, moving back to football, Tapiwa, how impressive have you been with Kamavinga so far? He had a really good game in this game. He was good against Manchester City. What's his future on this team for the next season and for seasons. Yeah, I've been really impressed with Kamavinga, especially how he's grown into the season because as we saw at the beginning of the season, he started off really well when he was coming off as an impact sub in those early games like against Inter and a couple of La Liga performances. Then he sort of dropped off where he was still getting those substitute minutes, but he wasn't really performing and it went a bit quiet for him. And then there was a period when Carlo actually finally started using him as a starter and he's looked a bit shaky in games where he started especially against uh Sevilla I think that was the one where he almost uh, got sent off and so I think of course these are still like the growing pains that we'll always see with young players and going forward I think he's going to start getting a bigger role going uh going into next season but I still think he has a lot of work to do before fully becoming a starter for this team yeah. And who do you think he'll replace, Tony Kroos or Casemiro? Because he could play both roles. I think at this current stage, he replaces Kroos because his defensive game is really good, but he still has a bit of that uh, bad decision-making on the ball, so he's not ready to be a direct Casemiro replacement. But to be fair, Casemiro also has bad decision-making on the ball, <laughs> so <laughs> it's a fair uh, yeah. But those passes, man. Passed the Benzema for that first review ago. He was also there when. The yeah, it's it's like he's a different back. player when he goes into the final third. Yeah, yeah. But enough to talk about Real Madrid. The other Champions League team, Villarreal. I don't know what to say about them because in that first half, I was dreaming. I was dreaming. I was like, maybe, maybe they have a chance. But then Geronimo Rui gave a disaster class. Just close your legs, man. <laughs> Is it all Rui's fault? <laughs> I mean, don't be harsh, but it's not all his fault, but he played a big part in Liverpool coming back. But let's get this out of the way. That first half from Villarreal was, my God, awesome. Like, they had Liverpool, the 
arguably the best side in Europe shook. Like, I've never seen Van Dijk look that scared in a long time. That's how great Villarreal were in the first half. But then it felt like they put too much into it, you know, and then the second level half, they ran out of gas. But they were still hanging on. It's just like, but it's just that, like you said, really, once you don't close your legs and you give Liverpool an inch, they'll take him out. And that's what happened. Yeah. And it's the same conversation we're having with moments, right? Tapiwa, it's the Champions League is about moments. And when Fabinho scores, then Liverpool get that moment. They score the second. But then it's like big mountains high. Yeah. yeah, once once the momentum swung, then you could start to see Villarreal players get visibly shaky. And I think in a moment like that, it's up to the coach to either make uh, like a tactical change to sort of stem the tide as it were but uh, unfortunately Emery didn't have anything in his tank and I think uh, John and Terry mentioned this on their podcast that uh, if Villarreal's perfect scenario would have been if they could have had an, a, a different manager in the second half use Unai <laughs> Emery for all the first halves and then sub yeah. him at halftime and because they should have kept going for it but they it's yeah. like they sort of relaxed and they thought okay let's play for extra time in the second half and I also wonder whether they have the personnel to go for like four blocks or for 19 minutes. Because you had Gerard Moreno, who is without doubt their best player and one of the best players in La Liga when fit. And when he was in that first half, half fit, he gave Liverpool so many problems. He was like putting the strings, bringing Van Dijk out of position. But when they lost him to injury, although I think they already conceded the first or second by then, by then, but you could tell it was a different team. And Dan Juma wasn't able to play. So I wonder whether it's more, although Amir's tactics were wrong, but I wonder whether Snow has something to do with it as well. Yeah, Gerard definitely had a, a part to play in it because they look a completely different team when they have him up front as an outlet. And going forward for them, they played very well this weekend in Sevilla, but thing with Villarreal is they always have it in them to make the dumbest mistakes. <laughs> the corner they gave away was so yeah. yeah. And when offensive yes, what I was like, this is this is the definition of receiver. Yeah. Pretty much it's like they're so close but so far. Like like the biggest example is the game against Atleti at the wonder where they a few seconds from winning it, like all you have to do is just do it is so hopeful past and then they do what they did. So yeah, it's like that's basically their season in parts in the league though, but in the Champions League it's a different story. It's been a fairy tale, you know, the friends you made along the way and all that. Yeah. Yeah. It's a remarkable run. Right? Like they yeah. beaten they, they lost Liverpool, but it's not sure it's just Liverpool. They beat in Bayern, they beat in Juventus. They were in a pretty yeah. tough group with Atalanta and United. Maybe not United, given how the season has unfolded, but it's it's been a good run. It's been like it's a yeah. eight out of 10, ten out of ten Champions League, considering their budget. Yeah, it's been a very memorable run for them, and they'll be remembered favorably, like the Malaga teams and Ajax and everything, where a team. Yeah did really well and didn't end up winning it. Sort of like the fairy tale, like Oscar was saying. Yeah. But to make the season not feel like a bit of a disappointment, they do have to get into Europe. Preferably Europa League, but, you know, Conference League isn't a bad competition. Yeah. I don't know, like if I'm Villarreal and I just say Juventus, Bayern, going to the Conference League and no offense and playing Bodo, and the smaller teams, it might feel like a bit of a drop down. Like, yeah, it's like a bit of a drop down, but you know, it's a very good chance to be the big dog in a competition for once. Yeah, that is true. But in terms of finishing there, they have competition from Athletic, who played a miserable game against Valencia. The less said about that, the better. But for Rapsa that again, they lost and. Um, it feels like the area will get that It's a matter of time. Yeah, I, I believe Real Sociedad and Villarreal have to play each other, right? Yes. I think is. I think they do. So that game will be important. 
Yeah, it's, it's definitely between them for that last year, public sports. Athletic, they have one great performance and then they have another, an equally bad performance the next week. So I don't think they will get seventh. Yeah, I think it is the best they hope they can get this season. Let's talk a bit about the area of Poland City yeah, because they had mirrored each other in both United Emory and Lopsegi, both the men of Sevilla. And they're both similar ish coaches. And if I'm, I'm a Sevilla fan, I'm looking at what United Emory has done in Europe. I would have huge questions about Julian Lopsegi because he had an easier group. Mm-hmm. Um, Sevilla, they're a better team in terms of what's your players. So why do both of you think that Sevilla have not reached up to the high Sevilla have in Europe? I think Lopetegui needs to be a lot braver in these games because we've seen Sevilla go into games where they're sort of still playing as the underdog. But there's a lot of the times when they are the superior team and they should play as if they're the superior team and actually go for it rather than keep treating it as if you're the underdog and playing, uh, being, re- um, what's the word, reactive, reactive instead of proactive, yeah. I think that holds them back. Yeah, I, I agree with you all. Even today, you saw that they had one shot on target for the goal against, like, your equals. It's not like you're playing around the grid or something. Yeah, and today they didn't even deserve to to, to get a point from no. that game, if we're being honest. No, yeah, like it should have been like four, if not the goal. Yeah, exactly. Bono, at this point, I feel he hates his defenders because they're costing the Zamora trophy. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, yeah in, in regards to what you asked about Sevilla and Europe, I feel their big problem in the group they had was that their opponents... Wolfsburg, Lille, and Salzburg, they all play quick football. And Sevilla playing too slow. When, once everything breaks down, it's easy to like just overwhelm them. So I feel like change, that their style has to change a bit for Europe. They also need to get fresh blood because most of the team is veterans at this point. So they need younger players. Lopetegui also has to change the approach too. The good thing for them is in La Liga, things aren't that bad because they are three points away from Champions League. As are Atleti, and they can give a big thank you to Barcelona. Yay! How were you feeling that late goal with Jordi on the squad? As soon as I saw the cross, I saw three players at this time. I'm like, it's going in. I just don't know who is going to hit. Now, when I saw it's Alba, I'm like, I just remember the Atleti goal. I'm like, it's done. <laughs> <laughs> <That's it. laughs> uh, the two of them running back to 2013, is it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah it was, on it the was game like, it, yeah. Go on, go on. On the game itself, it's you would feel for Betis because it was a pretty even game. And Betis, to be fair, they had the better of the chances sure. that came. Although Barca had more volume, but Betis had the better opportunities and the quality issues score then after the Betis came back they should have scored the winner but yeah but Barcelona ever since Xavi came they have that resilience that Real Madrid has. yeah Betis would feel like they were a bit hard done by especially with that uh, Betzela miss towards the end when they should have gone ahead but like, like you said Barcelona have shown good resilience and it's something that they didn't have at the beginning of the season so even if their form has sort of tailed off uh, as they went into that Europa League game, but they've been very good, and everyone will be happy to see Fati back and fit, and hopefully he can stay fit. He's yeah. A yeah, Fati coming on, the guy just has this, I cannot explain, the guy just has this factor where you know he's going to make a difference somehow, and that's something like only a few players have and possess at that young age, so hopefully he stays injury free and can live out his potential for us, which would be a massive help, honestly. I don't have the stats in front of me, but it's goals per minute ratio must be incredible because every time this guy comes on the pitch, it's something. Yeah, so I actually have the numbers. It's for his four goals in the league this season, he scored every 65 minutes. It's almost That's like Barcelona, Lewandowski, or, or Holland. Yeah. yeah. 
Uh, Fatih has always been a very good finisher. I mean, he still needs to improve other parts of his game for sure. But in terms of finishing, like since this guy started playing for us, it's never been a question that anytime he scores, he, he almost has a, tr- a two and a half in four ratio in terms of shooting from the last time I checked. So is the secret to Barcelona challenging Real Madrid next season, keeping as a fancy and Pedri fit? And it's not just him. Keeping Pedri fit, keeping, keeping everyone fit, because if we have another injury disaster, we're not challenging Real Madrid at all. So we need to avoid injuries, especially to Pedri, Fati, and other key players. From a rival perspective, yeah. I'd say they also need to. Uh, sorry for butting in. I'd say they also need to beef up their defense. Sure, that that's that goes that same. Yeah. <laughs> Especially when PK is PK is like not there. It's crazy that Barca is so blind. A thirty-five yeah. year old. A thirty-five year old that is limping through games at this point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because. Yeah. Araujo is good, but Eric Garcia and Longley do not fill you with any confidence whatsoever. But I bet my bottom dollar is somebody who will pick Eric Garcia for the world. <laughs> of course. We already know who is going to the Euros. Every single yeah. Barcelona Spanish player plus Carvajal and anyone yeah. else. <laughs> maybe, maybe Carlos Salah will be there. <laughs> Carlos Salah, when he come, if he comes to Barcelona in the summer, but I don't think that will happen. Yeah, it's, it's just where that Barcelona now is the quintessential staff to see. Yeah, it's back to 2010 again. Yeah. <laughs> For Betis, the form of, it's gone off a cliff ever since they got to the Copa final. They, they must have missed it. This is a huge missed opportunity because not just the Barcelona game, but if they had won against the Atlas, they, they won against Atafé and the game against Ross to see that, they'll be right on Atleti and Sevilla as well. Yeah. Exactly. I think I saw a stat where Real Betis have only won three of their last 15 games in all competition. I said that can't be true. I checked and it's true. There's been a lot of needless draws and defeats, like you said, to Elche, who didn't, don't have anything to play for at this point. And, and joined with Atafi, the Bartra goal was their first goal in, three, in four league games. So, yeah, it's been a disappointing run in terms of their top four hopes. Yeah, they really wasted a chance to, to close the gap on Atleti. But now I I think right now the top four is pretty much set. Given mm-hmm. if Atleti just get one more result, it's done. Tapi, what if you're the best sporting director, sporting director, and you're like, hey, we come so close to Atleti. What does this team need to make that leap to challenge them properly? Take it at least to the final day. I'm not too sure, like specifically what they need to pinpoint, but I think just generally raising the level of the squad. So just buying some good players in and around La Liga, especially mm-hmm. if we see a team like Levante go down, I would go shopping yeah. there, and just beef up the squad depth. And I think they have it in them to be able to to push a little bit more. Because I'm not too sure, like, specifically what player out there they could go and buy, except maybe a midfielder would be a rumors good addition. Rumors might get Isco. Yeah, there's rumors for, for Isco and Ceballos. Those would be good additions to Pellegrini's team. But Who's elsewhere, I'm not... Lazio. Oh, yeah, and that, yeah, the Felipe deal, I think that went through, right? Or yeah, right? and there's another winger coming in to Luis Henrique. Yes, yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I've worked 15 minutes of his YouTube clips. I'm an expert. He's going to be decent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I think just, just adding general good depth to the squad, good quality, and that will allow them to rotate a little bit more so that they don't drop off as much. Like we saw when they were preparing for the, uh, the Copa del Rey final, when, whenever they rotated, they were pretty much just giving the three points to the opposition. And you mentioned the Vance, they might go down. Not without a fight. It's like we already mentioned they beat Ross to that. Do they have any chances of staying up? Um, I think the fact that Cadiz and 
Grad that won this this weekend as well has sent us Levante Segunda. Because it's hard, it's a big ask to beat Real Madrid, even if they're distracted by something else. And Cadiz and Grada, they also have games where they can just win. Like next the next round of games, I believe Cadiz and Grada have more winnable games and would just sent us Levante at that point. Yeah, because Cadiz, they have. Real Sociedad, then they play Real Madrid. So it could still be complicated for that. Sure, but it need, they, like Levante need to beat Real Madrid to give themselves any chance at this point. Yes, it's Levante, they'll get it back. Yes, Levante, do, but you know. <laughs> it is. And the big game in terms of that relegation picture was Granada versus Marquette. Who saw that result? I didn't see the result coming at all. Damn, what like, a game. And Jorge Molina, man. How good is that guy at 40? He's, <laughs> he's like turning defenders, he's providing assists, scoring crazy goals. He I has mean, some sort of vendetta. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I guess <my> <laughs> Yeah, because he scored a hat trick in the reverse fixture this season and he got two goals and two assists yesterday. Like, Mallorca, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that was off the bench as well. He didn't even off the game. bench. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Scoring goals yeah. from distance, smacking one touch left foot shot. I'm like, this guy is on another level at this age. Yeah, like I didn't think it was going to be that much of a gap between both teams. But I, when I was watching the second half, but like you're right, he's amazing. It reminds me of where the older he got before he got that massive injury, he kept on getting better and better and better. Mm-hmm. And it's a testament to sports science. You feel he can continue doing this next season if Granada stay up. Yeah, it's very possible if he keeps himself in the right condition. He may not get as many goals as he did this season because you know he kind of stuck by there against one team. <laughs> but yeah. you know, <laughs> and that team won't be there, may not be here next season. So if he, if Granada manage him well, he can be very useful again next season. Yeah, and this was I took Granada's first win. Granada are surely safe, right? Yeah, I think at this point, like Oscar was saying, Granada and Cadiz have the advantage on on Levante, and they're pretty much it's in their hands to just stay safe. And I don't see Mallorca being able to pull out of that one. Honestly, yeah. Honestly, I see Levante ending in 18th America, possibly just finishing barely above Alaves. Uh, Alaves, they, they, they deserve to go down. Yeah, it's, it's been a shit show, for lack of a better word. I can't get constant. Thank you. <laughs> okay, go um, yeah, but hopefully the YouTube doesn't catch that. But yeah, with Alaves, it's been like every season they have three different managers for different spells. There's no consistency for the squad, and a long and a long a relegation that's been coming a long time is finally about to happen. Yeah, and watching that game, you felt that it was Salta who had more to play for in the mental team. And Alaves, they felt they felt they were already on the, on the beach and they were relaxing and stuff. I don't know. Yeah. Like, I feel the relegation has been coming. Yeah, I think even after the game, LaGuardia was saying they just never they never showed up because like from from the get go, it just looked like Celta uh, was a different level to them, and Alaves were just making constant defensive mistake after defensive mistake. It was just uh, it was inevitable. Yeah. And credit to Yago Aspas, man. Is another uh, one of La Liga's golden oldies who, season after season, keeps on getting those high levels. It's up to 17 goals. Out of like, it's been under the radar. Yeah, and he's going to hit 20 on Wednesday. He's playing Barcelona on Wednesday. That's the joke. <laughs> <laughs> That's his favorite team. You know, actually, Sevilla and Real said that his favorite team somehow. He's into double digits against them. Antagonist. (laughs) So yeah, there's antagonism because he used to play there. Yeah. 
And I guess the last team we haven't spoken about is Hadith, or we spoke about them briefly. They won three you know, so you know, Thank you. They look like they're going to be safe, pretty much. Barring yeah. Yeah. Oh, you can go ahead, Oscar. Okay. Yeah, it's honestly, unless Levante pull up trees again in their last three games, that is look like they're going to be the Premier Finals season. They generally what, look like an enjoyable team, kind of. Yeah, they counter attack pretty well. And Sergio, has, Sergio has been less of a terrorist than he usually is since he came. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's really true. Now let's move over to Serie A. Wow, Milan. What a comeback. Tax, the title yeah. is as close as it is. Yep, it's as close as ever. I wasn't able to to watch the game, of course, because uh, I was watching the the Madrid game, but I did see the result, and I'm very pleased. And I think at this stage in the season, Milan should be able to get it over the line, because going into these final games, the teams that they were really worried about were Fiorentina, uh, Hellas, and Atalanta. Those were the potential, I'd say, theoretical banana skins. And after getting past them, and with just Atalanta to play for, I think if they get past uh, Atalanta, it should be done. This feels like this mid-table team, they keep on scaring the, big, the bigger team in Serie A. Because Inter Milan, the other day, they were tuning down against Apulia, and they came back miraculously. Yeah, Inter almost got gunned down, and it was going to be... Uh, hilariously from Pinamonti, their striker on loan. <laughs> and like at 2-0, I think everyone was just in meltdown on Syria Twitter and they thought it was over, but they showed good resilience to, to come back and get it done. And like you said, yeah, it's been, surprisingly, it's been these mid-table teams that have been the biggest threats to the title challenge. Instead, you'd think it would be like maybe the relegation sides, that sort of thing. But no, it's yeah. all these teams with nothing to play for that just keeps trying to stumble up the title yeah. challenge. Yeah, and Milan winning the title would be huge for them. Like, people are not speaking about how like, big it is for Milan to win. Because even in the best of times, Milan, they didn't win that many league titles. But to win this league title, I believe, 11 years after, to come from the doldrums, that's, that should be huge. Yeah, it would be massive, and especially for Stefano Pioli, uh, who going in, everyone thought he was just going to, you know, stabilize the ship. And remember, there was rumors that Ranić was supposed to take over before <laughs> they appointed Pioli. Cool, <laughs> the, universe, <laughs> the universe could have been cruel if Ranić ended up. That's, a, that, that's the biggest Dutch bullet I've heard of. <laughs> 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 but yeah, now overall, Pioli's just done amazingly. Um, going into the season, I think uh, for Inzaghi, they were expected to challenge for the title. Pioli was also expected to challenge for the title, but not necessarily win it. And then Juventus was the other team that was expected to challenge for the title with Allegri coming back. But it ended up being um, Napoli with Spalletti. So I think individually, Spalletti, Inzaghi and Pioli, regardless who ends up winning the title, those three coaches will be very pleased with their seasons, regardless how it ends up. Can I take a pot shot at Spalletti? Sure. <laughs> I, 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 had the word, I had the word bottled. Like, geez. They were, Napoli were so clear, heads and shoulders of everyone. And now they're in a position where they're not going to win the league. Like, what changed for them? Is it? Osman stopped scoring and all of a sudden Napoli's not good anymore. And then I, the I, performance against Barcelona. Like... I can't necessarily put my finger on it. I would like to attribute it to Napoli's bottling gene within him <laughs> because we've, we've seen them do this year after year after year where they get so close and then something just happens and they implode. But like jokes aside, I think... I think they did well to be in this position. So like you said, they would be massively disappointed after the way they started the season. But I think at the start of the season, none of us would have predicted Napoli to be in the top three to begin with. It's been a match story of Serie A domestically. I have one, one or two questions, both, and either of you could take it. The first one is, 
what do Serie A teams have to do in the Champions League to take that step? Because since Juve got to the final or Roma got to semi-finals, they've struggled really to get past that quarterfinal. So what, like, for example, does Milan have to do to take that step? I think what Milan and Inter to do is keep their is to keep the squad and add to it instead of having to lose players every year. Because I feel like Inter could have done a better job if they kept Lukaku and Hakimi, but teams being what they are, it's not easy to do. So if they could get that right and keep their core and add to it instead of subtracting, then they have a chance in Europe. And the other question I had or maybe statement was, it's a big week for Serie A because Roma got to the UEFA Conference League final. And given Mourinho fans, it's going to be the greatest competition ever, greatest triumph <laughs> ever. The special one is back. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but yeah. if Roma win this, Mourinho will be the first manager to win the European trophy for Italian clubs, Mourinho. <laughs> Oh, wow. So true. yeah, I'll never hear the end of it from. Yeah, exactly. It's an agenda. Yeah. It's an agenda that they are going to run with to the end of time. Yeah, and imagine if Cristiano wins it next season. I'm sure. The oh, good. Oh, wow. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> nah, Universal nah, Europe. Nah, if 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 I United win it next season, everyone should just hide because Twitter is not going to be a safe place anymore. <laughs> Over the greatest, but, but what's wrong with that club? Man? I, I saw the results and I was like, how is this happening to United? How is it not happening to United? I wasn't surprised. <laughs> <laughs> why, why are you still surprised? It's not United. Yeah, someone actually jokingly predicted a 4 0 result in one of the, <laughs> the fantasy football chats, and everyone thought he was joking, but he was being dead serious, and it ended up 4 <laughs> 0. And there's no Harry Maguire to scapegoat yesterday because he didn't play. It was Varane and Lindelof. Now, while Maguire is not the best defender, like it's silly to say my United went from second to seventh, is it? Sixth or seventh because of him. It's been the whole club what is a mess. What happened to Varane, though? Like, I feel so bad for Varane. Yeah. The thing with Varane, from my point of view, is that since the World Cup, his level dropped a bit. Yeah, it was a good in 2019, but 2019-20, but he still managed to end that season with a disaster class against Francis. Yeah. So I feel like the decline or drop in level has been there. And then when he came to a club that has no standards, it just became totally <laughs> bad. <laughs> it's, it's the truth. <laughs> There's no sugarcoating anything at this point. Do you think he hard. ends up like Umtiti or oh, I, I, I pray not. Second I, life for him. There's a second life for him if he gets out. <laughs> or if Enten Hag is somehow a miracle worker and can make the best out of an absolutely horrible situation. What if you Ten Hag, you're scared. What's pushing that? I have a lot of work. Yeah. Because you need this that team realistically needs nine good players to come in to raise their level to Champions League team again. No, I don't get why every season it's like next year, next year, three or four good players. They get three or four good players, then next year it's like, oh, next year, next year, four or five good players to compete. <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> uh, it's because they keep buying the wrong players, to be fair, because yeah. this summer. The biggest thing they needed was a central midfielder. They went and uh, added they another striker. They bought two. Okay, Sancho, you could say, was necessary, but now there wasn't. Before. Granted, he has played well for them, but that was money you could have invested elsewhere. Yeah, and I think that's also like a hot topic around where people try to say, oh, Ronaldo's the fault or he's not the fault, that sort of debate, like we saw and in Juventus. But I think ultimately, at the end of the day, like you were saying, Oscar, he was a signing that wasn't needed. And if United weren't ready to create a team that was going to be able to play to his strengths, just like the mistake that Juve made, then don't sign him. Yeah. It was a panic buy. The only reason why I said he mentioned that is because he could have done Because Man City. 
yeah, yeah. Man, man city was the only reason why <laughs> they went for no it's the same reason why they went for Alexis sanchez man city yeah that's unreal that's been that dramatic yeah, the strat- man city, yeah oh sorry no go on go on go on yeah, I've had of city, of <laughs> match United. like their types of charge got a lot easier or slightly easier they beat newcastle by five goals to nil and liverpool drop points against spurs so is, is it getting closer for city yeah i feel like the fact that liverpool have given them breathing room and the fact that city really padded their goal defense means that they are going to see this out because liverpool will still be distracted in some way by their final in france yeah, I think Man City may still drop points, but at this point, yeah, Liverpool are too distracted, like Oscar was saying. Liverpool's chance to, to get the title, they needed to get a result when they faced each other. And I think that was the only way. Which team would have had a better season? Liverpool, who they've competed for all four. They've won one. They've gotten close in three. Or City, who will most likely win the Premier League. Do you think, who do you guys think have? Is that a better seat? That's a Liverpool win the Champions League. If Liverpool win the Champions League while staying within three points of City by March Day 38, I'll say it's them. Because you know, they've proven that they are a very strong team over the long marathon. They just were lucky that the team was slightly stronger than them. And they've won Euro's biggest competition. So I say they did that win. But we have made that point with like when Real Madrid were like gets into Champions League finals and Barcelona were winning leagues. Yeah, but that's that was kind of different <laughs> because Real Madrid were going to those fa- the 2018 final in particular as a last chance to save their season, which was <laughs> that that's the truth. Because if Zidane lost Very that true. final, he was going to be yeah. sacked. Yeah. So the yeah. yeah, so it's kind of like <laughs> the 2017 final win plus the league win. That was. Very, that would have been very satisfying for a Real Madrid fan because you've won the league and you've proven you're the best team in the world without any doubt. Yeah, I always sure. say during the three-peat, I think we were only the best team in Europe in the 16-17 season. The other two, we were just a good cup team. Let's talk about Liverpool City. Better season. Um, I'm not too sure. I think overall, I would say City. But like Oscar was saying, the Champions League would be a big factor for Liverpool if they were to win it. But I think at the end of the day, there's more on the line for Liverpool. Because if they were to lose everything and just end up with the Carabao Cup, then they could end up like uh, the famous Bayer Neverkusen team. Where they were on yeah. for a treble and they didn't end up winning anything. So ultimately, yeah, if they finish the season with just the Carabao Cup, it'll be a disappointing season. Yeah, but it will a, be a very good season for them, but just ultimately disappointing. Yeah. And speaking about disappointing seasons, it was a disappointing one for Leipzig when they got knocked out by Rangers. Because how big is it for a Scottish team to be in the European final once again? Yeah, it's so, absolutely it's massive. massive. The fact, you yeah. the oh, sorry. Go on. I was saying the fact that the, Sp- the Europa League is finally going to be won by a non-Spanish or non-English team for the first time since 2010, I believe, or even further. It's just incredible. Yeah. It's a real dominance by those two countries. And I'm super happy that for once, it'll be won by a different country. And I track as well as Rangers, Eintracht, they've been the sensational tournament. Not only them, but the fans have been impressive. Like, you feel like yeah. that fan base deserves the title. Yeah, they, I think they do. But, uh, yeah, they've been, the fans have really been a 12th man throughout this tournament for them. Yeah, they've literally took over our whole stadium and carried their team through. The team is also great. Oliver Glasner has done a great job. I personally like him a lot, and I hope he gets silver where to show for his efforts. And how big a bit, how big of a deal would it be for Germany winning this? 
German football, as we were talking about, like Brian already wanted to leave for the million time. It's been laughed at because of that. But with this, it, it, it's going to be a game changer. The discussion. Yeah, it's going to be. If Frankfurt's win, it is going to really inspire the other teams to take the competition more seriously and try and win it. Personally, I thought if a German team would have won it, it would have been by Leverkusen, but they got knocked out of Atlanta. So maybe this would be like the team they need to push them on for next season. Although they'll be in the Champions League next season. But anyway, you get the point. Yeah. My bet was didn't happen. The big news in Germany was Salka returning to the Bundesliga. We really missed that Rivers Rivera that we haven't seen in Tepila. Yeah, Schalke coming back is going to be massive for the Bundesliga. Like you're saying right now, the Bundesliga is in a moment where Bayern is steamrolling everyone else. There's not much joy outside of Frankfurt doing well again in Europe because Leipzig does well, but we all know the relationship that Germany has with Leipzig, so no one really <laughs> celebrates any of their yeah. achievements. So yeah, Schalke coming back will be massive, and they didn't even make it easy for themselves because they were 2-0 down only to come back and win 3-2. But I think, yeah, that derby coming back into the league will be helpful. Because another thing that's hurt the Bundesliga so much is that the traditional big sides in Bundesliga have been so poorly managed. So whilst we all sort of blame Bayern for like stripping these teams of their players and everything, we also need to look at the way that these clubs have been managed. Yeah. It's a I'll say that you can go to Kovac was managed, but when Carlo went to slump at Bayern, they should have won leagues in those head of those years, but yeah, they, they have really mismanaged. But moving on to France, we had another Berta with Nantes. Moses Simon, they <laughs> will. <laughs> and it's their first in 17 years or more. Or two. And also in Portugal, Porto, when it in Benfica, which is incredible, he won at the final minute. <laughs> Imagine if that happened in the Madrid Derby. Oh, this. <laughs> There'd be a fight for sure. <laughs> People's emotions yeah. would just go all over the place. It's it's crazy, right? It's like Bayern, they won the Portland and chance if Barcelona is still up that Roman just did one that's in the stadium so I, and at that point I was like I wonder what's going to be worse CEO or Roman could win it I think that's how yeah I, I guess the Pasillo is better because you can choose not to do it but having to see your rivals celebrating on ground is, has to be a different level of <laughs> Imagine Ruby Alice in the type of <laughs> that was so embarrassing. <laughs> yeah. I guess that, that's all we have with the thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thanks, Oscar, as usual for being here. You're welcome. No problem. Thanks for having me. Yeah. No problem. Wonderful week. After La Liga action, Serie A action, Premier League action, Bundesliga, you name it. And, and balance.